Funding for the reporters is provided by Friends of Channel 4 Incorporated and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Uh, never in the history of this country has the United States Supreme Court recognized uh, a privilege under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution that it would allow any media source, regardless of whether it's television uh, or written media or radio, to secrete evidence that is proper and real evidence in a criminal prosecution. Not everyone agrees with Prosecutor Harris's interpretation of the Constitution, but it was the basis for this now famous search of the newsroom at KBCI Television in Boise last Saturday. County law enforcement officials used a search warrant to do this, and they were looking for videotape shot inside the Idaho State Penitentiary during the inmate riot a week ago. Tonight, the role the press played in the prison riot. Good evening. For two, perhaps three days last week after inmates ransacked the Idaho State Prison south of Boise, that was the biggest story in Idaho. Since last Saturday, when a warrant was issued to take those videotapes of the riot from KBCI Television's newsroom, that has been the big story in this state. The whole First Amendment flap has virtually overshadowed now the multi-million dollar prison riot itself. It's become a national story. The New York Times this week even wrote an editorial about it. The whole affair has raised some troubling questions for journalists in this state, Trouble, troubling questions concerning the role they played in the prison riot story, and it's renewed the debate over what right, if any, reporters do have to keep at least some of the material that they gather confidential. Tonight, we look at the conduct of reporters who covered that prison riot story, and we ask some more questions about why journalists think all of this is so important. This is some of the videotape law enforcement officials took from KBCI's newsroom last Saturday. This particular segment was broadcast by the station last Wednesday night. Prosecutor Harris still does not have the original videotapes he wanted and hoped to get with his search warrant. He has copies. He's negotiating now to confirm that the copies are in fact complete. He says he has no immediate plans for other search warrants. Harris was criticized yesterday by Idaho Attorney General David Leroy, a man that Harris used to work for, for not exhausting other legal options before using a search warrant. Producer Gene McNeil talked with Harris Tuesday night in what he called his last public statement on the subject and asked if there wasn't another way to have handled the situation, a way in which everyone could have had their day in court. Well, unfortunately not, uh, although I wouldn't admit that KBCI didn't have their day in court. Uh, they did attempt to uh, have uh, a judge, a district court judge, I issue a stay on the execution of our search warrant uh, on Friday. Uh, they failed to convince the judge to do that. So it isn't as though they didn't have any recourse. They did attempt a recourse. Uh, in Idaho, there is simply no procedure available short of a search warrant to seize evidence unless a person is willing to give up that evidence voluntarily. And obviously KBCI was not willing to give up that evidence voluntarily and so essentially our alternatives were limited to one and that was the one that we finally had to utilize to obtain that information. As it was reported, Judge Schroeder was willing to hear that case this week. What made it essential that it be done immediately? I, I never heard the judge say that. Uh, it wasn't uh, represented to me that he would be willing to hear it next week. That may have been something that the judge mentioned to legal counsel for KBCI. I did not hear it, and therefore I can't uh, subscribe to its accuracy. Uh, we did need those tapes immediately for the following reasons. Number one, uh, the investigation was bogged down as of Thursday afternoon. Uh, the investigators knew that a majority of the hardcore criminals within the penitentiary who were involved in the riot were going to be shipped out of state and would not be available for later uh, communication. Uh, secondly, uh, we were getting, obviously, as is the, the case in any penitentiary riot situation, absolutely no cooperation from the only eyewitnesses we had, uh, namely the inmates themselves. Uh, and the cooperation that we felt we were getting from the penitentiary guards was not going to be sufficient for us to proceed. Lastly, we knew that if we could ascertain what we could eventually prove in court through the use of the uh, videotape uh, material, we would know uh, which inmates we could approach and which uh, inmates we might be able to, 
to uh, put pressure on to cooperate by way of uh, testimony and giving of evidence. So it was absolutely important that we have that material uh, within a 24 or 48 hour period uh, of their recording. You wrote in a guest opinion in the Idaho Statesman that you felt that KBCI reporter Bob Loy had given up at least some of his First Amendment rights when he acted as a go-between in the situation. Now you seem to be saying that that's just a philosophical issue, not a legal question, that there weren't any First Amendment rights anyway. What is your office's position? Well, the legal position is simply that the United States Supreme Court has never uh, recognized the cloak of a privilege as protecting media people or outlets from a legitimate search and seizure of criminal evidence. That's the bottom line with regard to the search warrant, and that's the bottom line with regard to the legal rights of KBCI. Uh, the Supreme Court, based on constitutional law, uh, has never recognized that to exist, and uh, I don't expect them to, uh, uh, with perhaps some, some need for clarification, I don't expect them to give any wholesale right to uh, reporters to protect uh, from scrutiny of law enforcement real evidence of crime, and that's what we have here. So the, the question of what, what Mr. Loy's role was is not a legal one? No, probably not. Uh, if the court eventually reaches the point where it's going to recognize a First Amendment privilege against search and seizure, then we'll get into the question of whether or not Mr. Loy was acting as a reporter or as something else. And uh, I wanted to certainly clarify my position in that regard early on uh, because I feel fairly strongly that he was not acting as a reporter and I think that's concurred uh, in by a number of reporters who I've uh, discussed that matter with. You indicated, though, that you felt he, I think the quote is right, sacrificed some of his First Amendment rights. If yeah. he didn't have them, how could his role be well, a sacrifice? The law with regard to First Amendment privilege is sufficiently unclear uh, as of now that there may be some rights there. Uh, the Supreme Court in the Stanford Daily case seem to indicate that when Fourth Amendment rights start infringing on First Amendment rights that, that you have to use absolute caution. Now that may mean there's a higher standard uh, to be met with regard to search and seizure where First Amendment rights are involved. Uh, so it's sufficiently unclear that I felt we needed to clarify our position uh, with regard to Mr. Loy and the capacity he was serving at the time of that negotiation business. Would you then be less, feel on, on less strong legal grounds if, for instance, Mr. Loy had simply uh, gone to the prison and taken notes and shot the same kind of videotape that other reporters did? Probably, yes. Probably. I would, at least philosophically, again, I would feel uh, less certain about my position. Legally, uh, I don't know that that would make a whole lot of difference. As you've indicated, this is obviously going to be a difficult case for the state to prosecute. Will the Channel 2 tapes be a basic part of the state's case? I expect as this investigation uh, uh, comes along that, that that will become more and more the case. Uh, I suspect that uh, based on experiences law enforcement has had in other states involving penitentiary riot situations and with regard to penitentiary crime in general, it's extremely difficult to obtain eyewitness testimony because the eyewitnesses are inmates themselves and you've got obvious, obvious uh, harassment problems with regard to them cooperating with law enforcement, as well as, as the fact that they generally don't tend to be the kind of people that cooperate with law enforcement anyway. So I foresee that those uh, tapes uh, may be uh, eventually, at least in some of the cases, the only evidence that we have available. And uh, that's unfortunate uh, because maybe even the tapes themselves aren't going to be sufficient in, in some cases. Director of Corrections Bill Crowell was a first-hand observer as reporters tried to do their jobs during the prison disturbance. And Crowell says he was satisfied with the job that the press did. He talked with producer Eric Malone. As far as I'm concerned, the press behaved very responsibly. Their attitude was great. The support they gave me, I thought, was fantastic. If a phone was in use and I needed an outside line and a, and a reporter was on it, all I would have to say is, hey, I need the phone, and they were off of it immediately. And uh, so. Uh, as far as the sensational aspect, uh, this was a sensational incident. I don't see how you can divorce from uh, the sensational aspect from it because that's what they were filming. You know, it's not every day that you have a, a $15 million institution go up in flames. Should reporters be allowed inside the prison during the riot itself? The reason that I allowed uh, Bob Loy and his cameraman is because they were specifically requested by the inmates 
there had been some indications that the inmates had to have someone in there to, to show that the hostages were still alive, uh, not only for the other inmates to see him, but so that people outside would know. They specifically asked for Bob Loy and his cameraman. And I was, you know, I was, it was a tough decision to make because I was very concerned. I wasn't concerned specifically about the inmates that wanted him in uh, to take the pictures. I was concerned about the other inmates in the yard that might have been drunk. And I had envisioned myself as having four hostages instead of two. Well, Bob and his cameraman both understood the risk. They accepted the responsibility for it. And I allowed them to go in. And that's the only basis on which I allowed them to go in. We never, ever discussed anything about him bringing back inmate demands or acting as a negotiator for me, because I had my own negotiator uh, who was reporting to me. Director of Corrections Bill Crowell. Well, if Bob Loy's conduct at the Idaho State Penitentiary last Wednesday is not a legal question in the mind of the Ada County prosecutor, it has very much become a question for reporters to debate. Paul Reese is the news director of KBCI Television in Boise. Mr. Reese has been in the middle of the legal battle that is still raging over KBCI's videotapes. We asked Bob Loy to appear on this broadcast. He declined. Mr. Reese is here instead. Your position now, Mr. Reese, on the original videotapes. You're still holding on to them. We are still holding on to the tapes. However, I, would, I have to admit that uh, Mr. Harris has what he wants. Uh, those are, to the best of our knowledge, uh, the dubs he has have everything on them that he wants. He says he's negotiating perhaps to have a third party look at your originals of the tape to determine that everything is there. Is that agreeable to you? That would probably be agreeable, yes. Are you in the process of trying to work that out or is he trying to work that out with you? That's in the hands of our attorneys. They've been debating that back and forth. What uh, position are you in, or is Channel 2 in, KBCI in, as far as any action that you might take now in response to what has happened? I'd like to be able to tell you more about that, Mark, but I really don't. Uh, everything uh, is in the hands of our attorneys right now as far as what action we might take, and I just can't comment on that. Mm -hmm. you, you would expect some decision relatively soon, I think. I hope so. Yes, yeah. I would very much. Could you sketch for me in any way without telling me what you're thinking about necessarily or even planning what your options might be. Are there some legal options that you have? I'd like to help you out, and I'm not trying to uh, uh, evade the question, but uh, all of that is in the hands of our attorneys, and I would hate to say anything, not being an attorney, that would uh, hurt whatever legal action we might take down the road. Okay, well, I can see that. Let me, let me go around a little different way then. Okay. In response to what uh, Mr. Harris said on the videotape a moment ago, in your view, did the prosecution need your videotapes if, in fact, they did need them as quickly as they say they did? Did they need to, to get them from you as quickly? Could they have given you some time to respond legally? Well, I think so. We ran our uh, documentary last night, the half-hour documentary, and I can say that the bulk of the two-hour material was on that documentary. Mr. Harris uh, last week said he needed the tapes right away because he had to get going on the prosecution, and then I, I would observe that he took off to Sun Valley. Um, I, I don't see exactly what the big hurry was, and there's been a lot, uh, a lot of information on the other television stations, uh, in the newspaper, um, a lot of good video on, on both the other channels. Could you have somehow just said, when you found out that that search warrant was coming your way, could you not have just done something with those tapes, taken them home and put them under your bed, if nothing else? Yeah, if it was up to me, I would have taken them and hid them somewhere and not left them in the newsroom. Um, but our attorneys advised us that in Idaho there's a broad obstruction of justice law, and we would have been outside the law at that time. We would be suppressing evidence. And so they advised us to keep the videotapes there. <coughs> Mr. Reese, looking back on what's happened over the course of the last week, are you confident that your reporter Bob Loy and your photographer Mark Montgomery acted properly last Wednesday at the prison? Absolutely. Uh, I think Bob went in as a newsman. I, in my mind, there's no doubt about that. But uh, that's almost an aside issue to the fact that Mark Montgomery, our photographer, went in. Bob was asked to go in, then Bob said, I want my photographer to go in. The real issue is Mr. Harris wants the tapes. Mark Montgomery is the photographer and was shooting the tapes regardless of what Mr. Loy was doing at that time. And the tapes, uh, to look at them, you can tell they were shot by a news photographer and shot for news purposes. They did not run continually for while all the negotiating was going on. There's a shot, the shot here, there's, uh, there's an interview here that, that breaks off. They were shot for news purposes. It was, mm -hmm. it was news photography. 
Is it proper, though, and this question has been raised uh, in the context of the First Amendment question that's been raised, to have your reporter participate in any way in the negotiation process that did take place at the prison? I don't, I don't see that uh, you relinquish any of your rights uh, when you go in there. Bob made no deals. He has assured me of that, and I, I think Mr. Uh, Crow substantiated that on the tape. There were no written deals. There was no verbal deal, and if there was, he wouldn't have gone in. Mm -hmm. But he did in some way participate in the negotiations, even if well, he only relayed the demand. It's a citizens' committee, number one, and I, I, I guess you, you could debate uh, whether it's a negotiating committee or a citizens' committee. Uh, he was sent in there to be a go-between, to bring back uh, the demands of the prisoners. And from what I can see on the tape and what, what he has told me, that's basically what he did. He's sitting there taking notes and, and listening, of course, to what the prisoners are saying. We'll come back, Mr. Reese. Thank you. Another reporter who served on that same Citizens Committee that talked off and on during the prison riot with inmates is Gary Strauss. Mr. Strauss is a reporter for the Idaho Statesman newspaper in Boise. Mr. Strauss, you were in essentially the same position as Bob Loy, but you did not play really a public role in relaying the demands at least. Why not? I thought I would have been compromising my position as a reporter for the Statesman and instead of getting involved in any of the negotiations that transpired during our meetings with the inmates, I chose to take notes as an impartial observer of that meeting, of those meetings. Mm -hmm. Did your newspaper consider removing you from covering that story while you were in effect a member of the Citizens Committee, albeit a a non-negotiating member. Yes, there were some considerations. I, uh, I kept in contact with, uh, with my editors uh, during breaks with the inmates, and uh, they asked me several times if I'd participated in those negotiations. And when I said I hadn't, they chose to keep me on the story. What's the difference between participating and not participating? I think participating, you're, you're influencing the news, and you're, you're setting a precedent where there are conflicts of interest uh, as far as keeping a, an objective view of things. As an observer of the news, you are you're only observing it and you are only reporting on what you see, mm -hmm. and you have no influence on it. Do you, uh, Mr. Strauss, agree with the basic position that KBCI has taken in, in being reluctant and unwilling to turn over the originals, at least, of the videotape they gathered while they were in the prison? Yes, I do. Why? I think. Uh, by the TV station relinquishing their tapes, it sets a dangerous precedent for all journalists, print, magazine, uh, television journalists, everybody. Uh, once, once a TV reporter's film can be seized, uh, there's nothing really to stop uh, a search of a newsroom. Okay, the hard question, Mr. Strauss. Did Bob Loy overstep the bounds of being a reporter and become something more than that or something less than that? I think at the point he overstepped his bounds, he realized it and decided to pull himself off the story. Mm -hmm. But he, he continued to be some kind of conduit for information from the inmates to the people on the outside of the prison. Right, but at the point where he had done that and served more as a negotiator between the inmates and some of the people on the Citizens Committee, where there were several arguments going back and forth, mm -hmm. he decided to pull himself off that story. Okay. Finally, uh, Mr. Strauss, what lesson is there in this for all of us who practice this craft of journalism? I think there's a fine line uh, in a situation like this, a very special uh, situation, where the uh, appearance of a conflict of interest can be just as real as an actual conflict of interest. And that uh, quite possibly when there appears to be a conflict of interest among reporters, then uh, they should pull themselves off the story. Mm -hmm. But the larger question is, should they even allow themselves to get caught in a position where there is even an appearance of a conflict? I think you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. In this case, the inmates specifically asked that reporters be part of this whole process, uh, initially to remain, to be observers of what was going on at the prison. I think at the time, uh, we were drawn into the situation, and perhaps unwitting, and unwittingly, and uh, at that point there was really no turning back. Thank you. Finally, let's get another perspective now from yet another reporter who covered the prison situation last week and has since covered the First Amendment aftermath. Mark Wilson is the Boise correspondent of the Associated Press. 
What's the lesson in this, Mr. Wilson? Oh, I'm not sure there's a lesson in it, Mark. Uh, Tom Wicker won great plaudits for going into Attica, the Attica prison riot, and helping negotiate a settlement. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that there's, uh, uh, if the inmates have to talk to somebody and, and they trust uh, the, the third party role that the media play, I'm not sure you have a great conflict in, in sending uh, Gary Strauss or a Bob Loy in. Well, would your own professional ethics standards, whatever, or the Associated Press's ethics allowed you to do what Bob Loy and Gary Strauss did, in fact, do? Well, the, the Associated Press would not allow us to become negotiators. Uh, again, the question Gary raised, the appearance of a conflict of interest. Uh, I, I personally would like to stay as low-key as I can when I'm covering a news event because I think the presence of reporters at any time has a, an effect on the on the news event that's occurring. Uh, I've never seen a, a room where a city council meeting or whatever is going on, when a TV camera comes in, the whole atmosphere changes. So the presence of, of any kind of media changes it. And, and I have, I, I can see where the presence of, of media on the committee uh, changes the what happens, changes the news event, and I don't, I, I, tr I kind of wish that we could be just more observers than, than do anything that would change uh, the outcome of things. Well, as someone who was in a position to observe all that was going on there, uh, both in the, as the negotiations unfolded and as the press tried to cover this story, how much did the competitive desire on the part of the differing news organizations to be first with the story, to be first with pictures of what was happening, how much did that influence what actually happened? Well, a great deal, but uh, you're out there and that's your job to get the best news, get fastest, the quickest. There's a great deal of competitiveness in there. Uh, it's, that's has a lot of, uh, I, I think that's good. Uh, we've seen now over the course of the last few days uh, ABC do a 20-minute uh, broadcast on this whole thing. Uh, CBS, NBC, ABC have all done stories on the search of the Channel 2 newsroom. The New York Times had a lead editorial on Tuesday uh, condemning uh, what had happened here in Idaho. It seems to be there's more comment about the pictures of the riot than there actually was about the riot itself. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that, too, because the uh, it's kind of the question is the media interested more in, in uh, problems that involve media so are that, they? Well, I, I think this is pretty good evidence that, yeah, a case can be made for that. It's a little easier to come in and cover a court or a, some kind of a legal battle than it is to rush a TV crew in and cover a riot. The, uh, the networks that sent crews in uh, found out by the time they got here it was all over. So in a way it was, it was it, one way for them to pick up their, their kind of late coverage of the riot. This is the fresh angle on it. So it, it, it's still kind of the same story, but it is interesting. I think that uh, there's more more interest in, among reporters in the search than there was in the prison riot, mm -hmm. and we control the media. Let me go back to Mr. Reese. Uh, Mr. Reese, uh, how, how about this competitive uh, thing? Uh, we had the prosecutor saying at one point that your station, Channel 7 here, uh, and the statesmen were, quote, falling all over each other, end quote, to get inside the prison strike whatever deal was necessary to get the pictures and get the story. Well, number one, we, did, we made no deals. Channel 2 made absolutely no <coughs> deals. But I will admit to a competitive edge. Uh, everybody wants that competitive edge. Uh, that's your job to get out there and get the story. Uh, if not first, do the best job you possibly can. Yes, that's there. And you, you didn't allow that competitive desire to get the pictures, the exclusive pictures that you had to uh, influence your decision about how to cover it or, or what to say or what to do? Well, hindsight is great at this point, uh, but we're at a point where I think every reporter there wanted to get inside because they felt they could cover the story best that way. And um, Bob Loy happened to be there and be aggressive enough to, to be chosen to be the one. Uh, I might add they wanted our sports director, Alan Cutler, first, but he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. How did Bob Lloyd, did, did they actually ask for him? Now, I've heard this story, and maybe some no, other they asked, people No, they asked for, our, for uh, Alan Cutler, I believe. And Alan wasn't there, but Bob's from the same station. I, I don't know the quote, but I think Bob said, uh, I'm from Channel 2, I'll go. 
I heard that he said that my wife works for the public defender and she can maybe help you guys too. I've heard that rumor, but I, I don't know anything about that and I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, training do you give your people so that they know how to handle these situations? <laughs> Nobody really trains for a prison riot, I don't think. Um, I suppose we're derelict if we haven't done that. Uh, but uh, these things don't come up very often, and I'll, I'll have to admit, we uh, never really discuss what we do in a prison riot situation. Yeah. Gentlemen, is Mr. Harris even a little bit correct when, we say, when he says all of us, collectively, have had our egos a bit bruised by this whole episode, Mr. Strauss? Journalism is a, a, a business filled with, with large egos. Uh, I think perhaps what had transpired out of his office, some of the reactions by some of the people here in Boise, some of the reporters, there may have been a little bit of that, yes. Mark Wilson? I don't know what he's talking about. What egos were bruised? I, I, don't, I, I guess I don't even understand what, he, what he's talking about. I didn't see, uh, you know, there was a competitive fight out there to cover the story. Uh, it, it, you know, it was the closest thing Idaho has had to the, to play the front page. Uh, but, you know, because somebody got a good, good picture, and I mean, I said, oh, gee, you know, you beat me to that, that uh, photo. But uh, I, is he, I don't understand, is he, is he talking about the Eagles were bruised because he was allowed to come into Channel 2's newsroom? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't see where Eagles were bruised. Mr. Reese? I agree. I really don't know what he's talking about. There are some big Egos in this business, I will admit to that. But uh, I, I really don't see where bruised Egos comes into play. The bottom line here, what's the danger in what's happened, particularly with the, uh, the search of your newsroom and, and the uh, warrant issued for your videotapes? What, why is that so bad? I think it goes right to the heart of the public's right to know, and I don't think newsmen have any more or any less rights than anyone has. But if lawmen are allowed to come in and search and take videotapes, uh, of material that hasn't been on the air, that may or may not be confidential, or take uh, uh, notes from newspapers, uh, reporters' notes, um, our sources will dry up. And sources is what we live and die on in this business, as you know. And uh, we'll be doing nothing but covering the Chamber of Commerce. So if I can jump in on sure. that, Mark. Uh, a big problem here is, is the kind of public perception of, of the news media what rights we have, what rights they have. The First Amendment rights are everybody's rights. It's, it's the public's right. If, if you want to go uh, to whatever church you want, if you want to go to the city council and yell at your councilman, if you want to start your own newspaper, if you want to go in the street corner and preach or whatever, and, and these are the rights we're talking about. And when Jim Harris stands up there and says that Bob Lloyd lost, at least in part, his First Amendment rights, and then the governor goes on the at a news conference yesterday and says that he agrees that, that Bob Loy gave up his first, right, first Amendment rights by being a negotiator. That's when the problem we're talking about is that people don't understand, and, and people as high up as the governor don't understand what rights they have, what rights we have, which, the, the rights that everyone shares. This isn't, this isn't something we're talking about that it's, it's just Channel 2 or Bob Loy or the Associated Press. You know, these are our rights and, and the fact that, that people just want to go out and get those inmates and, and that they want revenge on what ha for what happened out there and they're willing to just trample, trample over everybody's rights, uh, that's, that's the big problem, in my opinion. On that defense of the First Amendment, we'll leave it there. Paul Reese, thank you. Gary Strauss and Mark Wilson. That's all for tonight. We'll be back here tomorrow. I'm Mark Johnson. Good night. This program was produced by KAID-TV, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for the reporters is provided by Friends of Channel 4 Incorporated and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.